Tetracancer Promona block. We're looking at the Fostex X15 Series 2 Multi-Tracker. I've already made a bunch of videos about repairing this unit. This video is more of a review. Should be of interest to anyone who's thinking about buying one of these or is just curious about the relative strengths and weaknesses of these sorts of contraptions. So far as I can make out from press adverts, uh, the date on the inside of the user manual, that kind of thing. This came out in 1984. There's an advert for the US market where they're using a picture of the Beatles, Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club band. The idea being that the tape machines that Sgt. Pepper was recorded on only had four tracks. And so from that press advert, I know that they were asking $500 for this at the time of release. You get inflation calculators now, so go ahead and type that in, but I imagine that's like $700, so what, like £500? So a lot of money really, a lot more money than you'd spend on one of these now. At that time, the other options that you had if you wanted a 4-track cassette recorder, Tascam's 244 was in the market. I think the 246 had probably come out. In terms of a small unit that runs off batteries, then really the only contemporary that it had was the Tascam Porter 1. Uh, here's Tascam Porter 1. If I do that, you can see it's a bit wider, a bit taller. Um, it's actually very slightly lighter than the X15. The X15 is a heavy little thing. Once you screw on the battery compartment, that uh, screws on two places here. That has an extra few inches here, so it's, I guess it's about the same size as the Porter 1. The other accessory that came with, apart from manuals and so on, apart from the battery compartment, was a carry strap. So you can see that it's got these little ducats in the corners, so you could sling it over your shoulder. It is a portable recorder, so it's a much less feature-rich unit than the 244 or the 246. And although the price was surprisingly high to me, it's the budget end of the market compared to the 244 or the 246. So, you know, it's more limited EQ. You can only record two tracks at once. No effects returns. Anyway, we'll get into those details a bit more in a second. Let's start with the cassette player. So the BIOS is set in the factory for Type 2 Chrome high bias tapes. The tape speed is 1 and 7 eighths of an inch per second so that's the same speed as commercial tape so if you got a pre-recorded tape and uh, the pitch control down here is set in the middle then you would be able to listen to the tape at the same pitch it was recorded at. That pitch control will allow you to go about 15% faster or 15% lower that facility is provided so that say you record the whole band and you want to dub a piano over the top of it but the piano is slightly out of tune you can make the whole band slightly slower or faster so that the piano is in tune with the band as with any one of these cassette multi-track recorders that i've seen it's a two head unit and it's got a raise head and a record playback head whether that playback and record head is an in playback or record mode depending on how you have the other controls set up there's nothing technically to stop that head from recording on all four tracks but the mixer and record playback amplifier on this have a restriction where you can record to either track one or three but not both or track two or four but not both it has Dolby noise reduction, which is always on. I haven't taken a really deep dive into what it sounds like to put like Dolby 4-track sessions into a DBX machine or vice versa, or how it sounds to run sessions that were recorded without noise reduction through a unit like this, which has the noise reduction system turned on permanently. Any noise reduction system is a compander, so it's compressing then expanding the signal so that you hear less of the noise floor. So that compression effect can do weird things to a competitor's noise reduction system that or to an untreated audio. But it's fairly subtle. When I've swapped tapes around like that, it sounded a bit weird, but not like unusable. And it's certainly not going to damage anything. It's just not going to sound at its best. The tape shuttle controls are mechanical. It's got a manual counter. Uh, there's no auto stop, so it won't automatically stop when it gets to zero. 
There's no return to zero facility, no memory locations, certainly no rehearsal facilities like you would have on some of the later multi-trackers with digital cassette controls. Like we go way forward to the 424 Mark III, you can set two points in the tape and it'll just play back that section over and over and over again so you can rehearse a tape before recording. No such luxuries here. The only real facility to punch in and punch out that we have is via two sockets here where you attach an accessory called I think it's a 9060. It basically looks like a turkey baster. And it's like um, a tube with a bulb. And you step in the bulb and the jet of air causes punching and punch out to occur. So if you wanted to be able to punch in and punch out whilst holding your instrument, then you would need to have two of these turkey basters. I've never used one, I've never had one of these things, but just the shape of them, I can well imagine me stepping on them and them and just slipping out from under my toe and hitting the dog in the face. In concept, I prefer the kind of piano pedal style switches that came with other units. I'll mention this again when we get to the mixer. The other thing that seems kind of unsatisfactory to me is that if you're playing guitar and you're twanging away, you can't hear what the guitar signal sounds like through the mixer unless record is engaged. So obviously if you're punching in, you can't hear the guitar until you hit that punch. And so if you're trying to play in time with the music, maybe you can't hear yourself properly and so you're out of time. And when you punch in, then the punching's fucked. It doesn't seem like a great solution. Obviously it's a budget model, but even budget models later on had some sort of facility so you could hear what's coming through the mixer when you're not recording. Let's have a look at the inputs. So we've got a headphone socket over here with the headphone volume and two quarter inch jacks unbalanced for unbalanced microphone cables here. We've got line inputs, RCA jacks here, we've got line out and then we've got four direct tape outs. That's a nice facility in this day and age, anything you record on to cassette is going to end up in the digital domain anyway. And so for people who want to dump it onto a digital audio workstation, if you do it in two passes out the stereo out, then there's going to be a little bit of drift between the first two tracks and the second pair of tracks that you record to the door. So even if you're moving the files afterwards, little inconsistencies in the motor speed are going to mean that those tracks don't line up properly. Whereas if you record all four tape outputs to four separate channels of your digital recorder simultaneously, then obviously the inconsistencies of the motor are going to line up in all four channels. So you're going to have a much easier time editing it in the digital domain. And then your power socket's over here. It's 9 volt and it's center positive. I've discovered at cost of great frustration to myself that there isn't very good DC protection on this unit. I'm used to task guns which are center negative, so when I plugged that in, I did quite a lot of damage to that circuit board. I had to replace two power mute transistors, two power rectification diodes, two uh, filter capacitors. Then in the process of locating those components, I ended up handling a lot of uh, crispy wires. They broke, there are all sorts of short circuits, and basically it was a nightmare. So if you get one of these, make sure you do use the right kind of DC wall warp. I don't know whether this is just because I'm more of a Tascam guy, but the layout of the mixer seems quite unusual to me. I mean, it's unlike mixer layouts that I've seen you know, in rehearsal studios, recording studios as well. Typically you would have gain at the top, then your pan and EQ, and then the fader is uh, basically listening back level. So on this one, these faders, they're the input gain if you're recording, and then in remix mode, then it's the left and right master bus. The monitoring gain, so what a fader would do in a Tascam mixer or in a you know, rehearsal room mixer, is handled by these knobs up here. And then on a per channel basis, you've got pan. Your EQ is for the left and right bus rather than on a per channel basis. And you've got a high and a low. I'll stick it up on screen exactly what the cutoff frequencies are. So no mid controls. This is your track arm switches so you can record to one or three, two or four. The switch here is the input for recording. Remix is also where you want to have these switches if you're doing a mix down. If you put that switch over to mic, then that's these inputs at the front where I'm tapping. If you put it to line, then it's these RCA outputs to the left where I'm tapping. If it's a remix, say you had track one armed, then it would be recording the signal from tracks two, three, and four. So that's how you would accomplish bouncing.
how easy is this to fix? Not very. It's quite hard to disassemble. Generic transport that's in it is also in the Porter one. Works well when it works well, but it's not especially easy to do things like change belts. So there's quite a few different belts which can go dry or break or go gooey. The lubricant on these tends to glue up goes hard, stops things from working. That requires significant disassembly and it's a difficult unit to disassemble. There's a common problem where the base plate for the heads cracks and a spring comes out and that stops the head from fully engaging. And that requires quite a lot of work to fix. The electronics, I've got a service manual, but the only copy of it that seems to be floating around, the schematics are more or less illegible. There's some decent labelling and annotation on the boards themselves. Uh, I don't know if it was particular to this unit, but the cables were very brittle. So anytime I handled it, I broke something else. The cables and everything, it was difficult to get them back inside, um, struggling for space. So yeah, this unit actually is the unit that I have struggled with most of any unit I've ever worked on. I don't know if that's particular to how this one was stored. I mean, it is work, fully working now. So yeah, not an easy one to fix in my opinion. Um, it is quite cheap in the second hand market. I'm not exactly sure how much the owner paid for this one, but I, I actually had so many problems with shorts and more cables breaking and everything with the board that has the oscillators and the power conditioning on it. that I bought another one. I think I paid about £40 and I've done a bit of Frankensteining, which is what I call it when you take the working parts from more than one unit to make one working one. I just, I'd reached the point where I'd sunk so much time into this, so we have the white flag and resorted to that so yeah you can get these really cheap in uk ebay at the time that i'm making this video which is early in 2021 so in summary what do i think of this yeah i'm not that much of a fan to be honest the pros are it's portable i think it looks really cool i do really like the look of the thing it does have the four tape outputs so that's a good thing to have yeah and it's cheap <laughs> so i mean if you're on a budget you like the way it looks there's an affordable one near you you don't have many requirements for features such as mid-range EQ, effects returns, the ability to hear what you're playing through the mixer without recording, then go for it. Disadvantages, fragile, you can't hear what you're monitoring. When I was testing this, I put the guitar through it to play it and the, you know, the guitar sounded quite bad through the preamp. Whereas the Fostex 250, I did some repair videos on that. And if you've seen those, you'll recall that I didn't actually get the transport working, but the mixer sounded really good. Like my guitar sounded great through the mixer. Uh, my guitar sounded like garbage through this mixer. So it's not a nice sounding mixer. Subsequent portable ones would weigh about a third of this. It's really surprisingly heavy for the size of it. So I guess that's quite a negative summary. I mean, I'm really only saying that because there are other multi-trackers readily available which I feel are superior. I mean, if there wasn't so much choice, then I would be pretty positive about this. But as it stands, it's one of the last ones that I would pick. Knowing what I know if I was suddenly had no multi-track recorders and was back in the market for one. Anyway, thanks for watching this far. Subscribe to my channel if you want to see more reviews, teardowns, repair tips, demos of multi-track recorders, cassette and reel-to-reel. -reel. Thanks for watching. Bye.